Let us all take a moment to pay homage to the perfect one. Let us bring our, let us bring our palms together in veneration of our teacher, our master, and our guide on the path to liberation. As we do so, let us also remind ourselves that this is the moment that we take to renew our pledge of allegiance to the ultimate truth that the Dhamma represents, to the destination that the Buddha represents, and the practice that we have embarked on that the Sangha represents. This is the Noble Triple Gem that is there to guide us. It is our saviour for now and forever. Let us chant the Namaskara to commemorate our purpose of being here today. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arhato Samma Sambuddhasa. Okay. Your practice of the Dhamma should have started giving you rewards by now. I know I'm looking at an audience who have already reaped some of the fruits of that. This is why I say this is one of the toughest audiences to give a sermon to, because there's you and there's you, all under one roof. But you have started enjoying the rewards of this, of this journey, this transformation that is taking place within you. You have started to interpret the world and the things that go on around in it in a different way. For instance, if someone shouts at you, someone tells you off, someone blames you, I used to think that the blame was made for whatever deed I had immediately done. You may have experienced that yourselves. You do something and someone blames you and you think that this is the rebuke that you get for the deed that was just immediately done, immediately prior to that. But that is a very conventional way of looking at the world. And so when, you get a, when someone tells you off, in a very worldly sense, if you recall your responses to the world around you and the people that live in it, chances are when you get told off or something, you have a comeback to that. You, you go back with an explanation. You then try to explain that, no, I don't deserve this blame. In fact, I deserve praise maybe, or I was not the one who did this, so why blame me? Because we always looked at the world in terms of action and reaction. In other words, the blame was directed at the action that was done immediately prior to that. It's the way that we always saw the world. That's the way we understood the world. But that is not true. It is a blame that draws and attracts a blame. If you had blamed someone, then perhaps you could be along the right lines to say that this blame I get is because I have blamed. But if you did just something else, maybe this was supposed to be here, but you put it here. Or maybe the time was 7.45, but someone set the clock to 8.45. And then they get blamed. But that blame was not because of that particular action. The blame, it's a blame that begets a blame. Whenever there's an action, 
the reaction to that has to be of a similar nature. So the blame that you receive today is not necessarily because of the action that you did immediately prior to that. It is most likely a blame that you had delivered, maybe the previous day, maybe some time ago, perhaps in a previous lifetime. It is impossible for us to say which particular action this reaction responds to. So it's, it's, it's difficult for us. In fact, it's almost impossible for us, virtually impossible for us to say which action begot this particular reaction. You can't say that. That is a Buddha jnana. But because people don't understand the principle behind this, they always feel that things that are directed towards them are a result of immediate actions, things that have just been said, things that have just been done, things that have just been thought and so on. And that's a wrong way of thinking. That's why you, may, you feel the need to address those situations and say, and you know, try and vindicate yourself and say, it's not me, it was not me who did that. I'm not the one who's responsible for that. But you forget that you might have blamed someone, maybe some time ago. See, when you, if you strike someone, then one of these days you're going to get struck back. One of these days. It's not, it's not, you can't say when that's going to happen. One of these days you're going to get struck back. But if you are patient, and if you have practiced that virtue of patience, if you are able to look at things and understand the world in a better way, then you realize that if you get struck, the response to that should not be a retaliation. Patience always gives you victory. Patience always win gives you a step ahead. It puts you a step ahead of the game. It always gives you... It avoids a moment of regret. That's what it does. See, when you hit someone, and you ask why you hit someone, someone asks you why you hit someone, and then if the answer is because they hit me, you have done the worst thing that you can possibly imagine. You understand karma and vipaka now, don't you? So why did you get hit in the first place? Yes, because someone hit you. So your reaction now, if it is to hit them back, then what's going to happen again? The same thing's going to happen again. But what if you are patient, at the very least? Let's right? say you, are, you have no understanding of the Dhamma, you have no understanding of karma and vipaka, but at least you're, you're patient, you practice patience. Either because you're a coward, it might be. Even if you're a coward and therefore you practice patience, or you, you know, you're, you're fearful of what might happen, but in any case, you don't retaliate, you don't hit back. This is the only way that you can avoid another strike. But what do generally people do? Or what do people generally do? When you are struck, you strike back. When you get shouted at, you shout back. When someone th something gets taken from you, you take something from them. It's an eye for an eye. Your practice in the Dhamma should have given you answers to some of these riddles, ladies and gentlemen. If this was the kind of person you used to be, it, can't, it can no longer be that. You can, you can no longer be that kind of person. You must have found a better way of addressing and resolving problems. Now, I don't know this. It is only you who know if this has happened within you. Are you someone who still fights back? Are you someone who still shouts back? Are you someone who still hits back? Are you someone who does tit for tat? Only you know the answer to these questions. If someone hurts your feelings, if someone says something that hurts you, what is the, the gut instinct? It comes from within, doesn't it? If someone says something to hurt you, then you feel like you have to respond. It's like an itch. Until you, until you scratch yourself, it doesn't go away. You feel like you have to do it. Take yourself down to some examples, experiences you've had, maybe recently, maybe some time ago. Someone says something and you know it's unfair, especially when you know it's unfair. <laughs> but what is fair and unfair? 
Yeah. When someone cuts across, drives in front of you, pull, you know, pulls up where you are supposed to park, you always feel like you have to say something. You have to do something because you have to restore justice in this world. Are you Chief Justice? It is this gut instinct that you have within you. It is the demon within you that always brings you misery, time and time after. Time and time again it does that. When you get struck, if you strike back, all you've done is, you've created the process for that to repeat itself. The very reason you got struck is because you struck. The very reason you get told off is because you told off. The very reason you get something stolen from you is because you stole something from someone. But just look at the world out there. What do people normally do? Exactly. Retaliation seems to be the quickest, shortest remedy. And there's a reason for that. Sometimes people regret after they have done the deed, don't they? After they retaliate, later on they begin to realize, mm, I should have been the better man. I shouldn't have done that. Why did I do that? Why did I stoop to such a low level? Why did I do what that person did? I should have, I, I should have known better than that. When a dog bites you, you don't bite back, people say. But all of that comes later. The reason for that is because of vexation. When the pressure builds up within, you've got to do something about that pressure. If someone stops you from doing something you want to do, hmm? whatever that might be, if someone stops you from doing something you want to do, whether it's going to a party, whether it's watching, a t watching TV, whether it's going talking to a friend, whether it's buying something, right? now, nowadays, you know, as adults, you have the freedom to do most of the things that you want to do within certain limits, of course, within legal limits, right? But you have family, so if you're the wife, you have to check with your husband. And if your husband doesn't let you do what you want to do, then you still have this resentment within. Why does he not understand what I want, what I desire, what makes me happy? Then you expect that person to change because there's a vexation within. That's the reason. You need to catch the culprit. Oftentimes you feel that the, that the reason that I'm suffering is because this person won't let me do what I want to do. The moment you think that, you're completely off track. You're lost from there on. You just go down a rabbit hole. When you want to do something and someone doesn't let you do it, maybe you know, take, take a recent example, because I don't know what your lives are like, but you know, Take a recent example. You want to do something and someone doesn't, doesn't let you do it. They stop you. They impede you. They forbid you. You have to get permission for something. You go and ask them, can I please? No, you can't. <laughs> then, what's your response? Immediately you feel that it is that person who has just stolen your happiness from you. You are happy all the while, but you know, they could have just said yes. Why couldn't why they have just said yes? It's not like they were going to lose anything. Now you begin to argue. Within, first of all, right? Sometimes if you, if you are a junior and they are a senior, then you, you draw a line, right? Beyond this line, I can't argue because if I do so, you know, then I'm going to get in hot water. So I better not do that. But still, if the pressure is too much to handle, then there are no boundaries. <laughs> How do conflicts happen? Wars, nations, they wage war against each other. Vexation is the key. It is not because they have done something or they have not done something. It's not the other party. It's never the other party. It's never the other party. Your practice in the Dhamma, your path to Nibbana is entirely dependent on this one point, ladies and gentlemen. You need to understand, you need to acknowledge that whenever you are suffering within, it is your own making. We teach the Dhamma, we learn the Dhamma, we study the Dhamma to help us better understand this very fact. That suffering is self-created. 
It's a great victory just to understand that. If all you do is nothing more than that, just understand that suffering is self-created, that's a great victory. It is something we always discuss amongst ourselves. When we talk to our Swami Nuhansis, talk to Anagarikas, Anagarikas, and we talk to our people, we, we are always going on about this fact. Whenever you experience suffering, come to your senses that suffering is all self-created. Because what happens until you realize this point? You look for answers outside. So now if you have to come to me, you know, you know amongst us are Anagarikas, Anagarikas, Sila Shravikas, Shravikas, and Uesis, and devotees who are regulars, right? You, are, you either come to the monastery and listen to the sermons, or you listen to the sermons online. Most of you are regulars. Faces that we've seen every day, you are now part of the furniture. That's why I don't have to ask you to sit down. <clears throat> so, by this point, you will have listened to so many sermons, you will have come along to many meditation programs, samma, samadhi, what not, you know, whatever you call it. Day in, day out, sometimes, most days of the week you're here, you eat pingbat. Right? So you go through this experience of the Dhamma, day in, day out, but it all boils down to one thing. All of this is for that. You can't claim to be practicing the path if at the end of the day, when you begin to vex inside, you immediately point your finger outside and say, stop that. Why did you say that? Don't say such things. You hurt my feelings. He made me angry. If that is what you come to at the end of the day, then not ping bath, aparadi bath. <laughs> that rise is in vain. No good has come out of that. See, this is the, this is the objective of our practice. You need to be able to recognize, first catch that vexation and then understand that this is all self-made, it's all within. This is no easy victory. It's not easy and it's, it's not something to be taken lightly. If you can identify that this suffering that has just arisen within you is self-made, you are already halfway there. You know what the mind does? Whenever the mind experiences suffering, the mind will always seek a path out. I can prove it to you. How long can you hold your breath? You know, if someone said, hold your breath and if you breathe, I'm going to shoot you. You're not going to die out of suffocation. You're going to die. How? For being shot. That's how you're going to die. You will not die out of suffocation. Why is that? You won't be able to hold your breath. Because the mind's going to experience the physical pain, and then because you internalize that pain, you think that it is I who is suffering, and then once the mind begins to suffer and experience that pain intensely, there comes a threshold. After that, matters not what. Otherwise, why do people go and jump off a bridge? If it is the body that made the decisions, do you think the body would allow the mind to do that? Why do people cut themselves? Some people out of stress, right? What they do is they cut themselves. They have, they have a blade, they cut themselves. Just to relieve themselves of the, of the internal anxiety, the pressure, the stress. If, the, if it was the body that made the decisions, do you think the body would allow the mind to make such decisions? No. I'll give you a few more examples. Now, please, I don't want any of you to be offended by any of this because some of these might relate to you on a personal level. It is not intended to be an in, in, insult, okay? Are you all in agreement with that? Right, so that I, I don't know. There are people online, right, and these things might sometimes offend people, but can I... Disclaimer, none of this is to offend. If you are offended by anything I say, it is because of your thinking, not because it was my intention. Take piercings, for example. Piercings. Some of them are cultural. Like, for example, ladies, you have earrings. If it was the ear's choice, if your body could decide, do you think your body would say, okay? 
No. But that's a cultural thing. I understand. So I'm not saying you shouldn't do it from here on. I'm not saying that your children should not have their ears pierced and have their earrings put on, whatever. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, you know, when you know that it's a cultural thing, now you want to fit in, don't you? What kind of vexation is that? Physical or mental? It's a mental vexation. Because if you didn't have your ears pierced, then culturally, you're going to be the one who stands out. You're going to be the cultural oddity. So you don't want to be that. You want to be someone who fits into your culture. So therefore, what do you do? You have to get your ears pierced. Yeah, because the parents are vexed. Ultimately, it's a mental vexation that leads to physical discomfort in that way. And think about some of the other piercings. People get all sorts of piercings from head to toe. Think about tattoos. Once again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't or should. It's not my place to, to decide what you do with your bodies. Right? But ultimately, your bodies are not your bodies either. So I have to ask the question, who's given you the right to hurt your body? To hurt that body? This body that you carry around is just a vessel. It's just a vessel for the mind, isn't it? Is this, is this not like a rental car? Is it yours to keep forever and ever and ever? Hmm? No, when you're done using it, what must you do? You get off and go find another one, right? Yeah. So this is not your car. Besides, it's not made of anything that you brought into this world when you came here. It's all made of parts of nature. It's the apple that grow on the trees. It's the sunlight, it's the water, it's the air. It's a product of nature, it belongs to nature. So what right do you have to hurt it? Anyhow, it's not my part to say what you should or shouldn't do with your bodies, but because you're here, you have given me the liberty to give you something to think about, some food for thought. But these are mental vexations. When someone wants to change parts of their bodies, sometimes they'll go through excuse me, plastic surgery. In a conventional way, you know, perhaps everything's right about their bodies, but they personally feel that something's not right. Maybe they're not big enough, maybe they're not small enough, maybe they're not round enough, maybe they're not flat enough, maybe they're not straight enough, who knows. But that's a mental vexation. So when those mental vexations strike, there comes a point where you have to do something about it. You've all been there. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You have all made resolves at certain points in your life. And then those very resolves were broken. Have you always kept a promise that you've made to yourself? Always? There's not a single soul in this room that can put their hand up and say, every promise that I made to myself, I kept it to the letter. Not even myself. At various points in our lives, we've kept promises to ourselves only to break them soon after. You know, when you make that promise, you know, this is a promise that I'm keeping for the better. It's only going to help me in improve myself. It's going to help me get to a better place. But what happens? What builds up within? Vexation. That is always your enemy. So this is why we have to study the Dhamma to try and fight this internal battle, to defeat this internal enemy. To do so, you must first acknowledge that the enemy is always within. So you must, by this point or soon from here on, come to a, a point in your life where anytime you're hurt, you must recognize that the problem is within. If that has not happened for you yet, then you're still a long way back. You've still got a long way to go. The Dhamma has merely scratched the surface with you, or not done much at all, still. Retaliation should be a thing of the past. It should be prehistoric now, for, by your terms. It should be ancestral. Can't be a thing of the present day. Just look at all the 
things that people say about us, all the all the admonishments that we get, all the telling off that we get, all the blame that we get, all the discredit that we get, we never retaliate. Because we are always in the present of noble association. As we are in the presence of noble association, whenever, even if a vexation arise, comes into the mind, we consult noble ones. And they give us the right answer. They always, you know, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the mind does not care which path you take to relieve itself of pain. Once suffering strikes, it matters not. It's like electricity. If you touch a live wire, what's going to happen? Hmm? If you touch a live wire, wire, then the current is going to flow through your body, right? That's when you say you're electrocuted. But why does the current do that? Why does it, why does it not recognize that you are a human form? So if, if, the, if, I, if I flow through you, then it's going to you know, cause you harm, it's going to cause you death. Why does current not do that? It doesn't care. All it's looking for is a conductor. So if current comes across a conductor, current will flow. In the same way, vexation. When vexation is there in the mind, it matters not how that vexation is to be relieved. It can either be addressed through the Dhamma, that's okay, or it can be relieved through Abhisankara, that's also okay. So the mind cares not how that vexation is going to be dealt with. It does not care. So if you don't give it the Dhamma, then Abhisankara is going to be the answer. If you give it the Dhamma, then it does not need to resort to Abhisankara. It's not like the mind has an affinity to Abhisankara. It's not like the mind says, no, 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 Abhisankara is the only way that I want to relieve myself of vexation, I don't want the Dhamma. The mind's not like that. If you give it an alternative, the mind will, will take that. This is what we are doing here. We are giving ourselves an alternative for when suffering strikes. Have you got yourself that alternative? So when you suffer, when you begin to, when it begins to hurt inside, when, it's, when there's stress, maybe through work, you're stressed. At, at work, you know, your boss is asking you to do this, that and the other, and you know, they just keep on piling work, one on top of the other, one on top of the other, and it's just getting too stressful. And there are then emails that need to be responded to, there are calls that have to be returned, Right? There are reports that have to be filed, then there's the taxes that you have to do on time. Then there are clients who are expecting you to go and sign the deals with them. There are targets to be met. Then the end of the year is approaching and you have to complete certain, some, some work before the end of the year. Then there are your subordinates whose disciplinaries you have to do. There are one-to-ones that have to be had. All of these things, yeah, everyone, you know, there, there are times at work even where you just feel like this is so much stress, don't you? See, at that time, when those things happen, you tend to look for answers outside. It's, it's quite natural. If you don't let the Dhamma do what, it's, what it can do, what it has the potential to do, you will start to look outside for answers. And every time you do that, you fail. Without question, you fail. That's why there's not a single soul in this world who's ever, gotten, who's ever gotten fed up of watching TV. One episode after the next, after the next, after the next. One film after the other, after the other, after the other. One song after the other, after the other, after the other. It's a never-ending business. This is just proof that it's always the wrong solution. You know that water quenches thirst because once you drink it, you don't have to take another at least until you're thirsty again. Right, I mean, for that particular moment of thirst. But what if you drank salt water? Soon enough won't you realize that this is not a, a solution to the problem. Because the more you drink it, the thirstier you're going to get. And you have to drink it again. And then the thirstier you're going to get. Whenever you look for answers to your problems outside, this is exactly what you do. It's like drinking salt water. That very answer 
exacerbates the problem. It's better for you not to, not to take a solution at all in the first place. If you did nothing when you were stressed, that's better than some of the things that people generally tend to do. And even on a very mundane level, you've experienced this. When you are stressed at work, you get back home and you usually take it on the wife. You take it on the husband, you take it on the children, you take it on the dog. Yeah? You take it on the furniture. You take it on the poor car. They have to bear the brunt of your vexations. And then what happens? Now you're, you're really stressed. Someone comes in and says, you know, please can you do this for me? Please can you do that for me? Please can you do this, that or the other for me? And then at some point you get really stressed and you, you pick up whatever is near you and you smash it on the floor. Been there? Don't nod. <laughs> and then what happens an hour later? You're picking up the pieces. Because no one's going to come and do that for you. And then what happens? Regret. Now can you put it all back together again? No, because Humpty Dumpty. You can't put it back together again. You can try, not going to work. See, how many times have you been through this? You've seen your parents do this. You've seen your elders do this. You've seen your grandparents do this, likely. Right? When Sia was really angry some, about something, he took it out on Achi. And then ended up hurting her feelings. Didn't he suffer the consequences of that? What's for dinner today? Do nothing. Go cook for yourself. <laughs> See, he had to suffer the consequences of that. You've, you've seen this happen in your family. You know, we're all, we're not Martians. We're all human beings. We've all been through the motions. We've all had these experiences. You know what I'm talking about. You know, although you look different, you know, your faces look different to each other. Now your stature looks different, your complexion looks different. Internally, you're all just a mind. Aren't you? Aren't we all just minds? So the principles that apply to one mind applies to the next, and the next, and the next. Your looks make no difference. Whether you're tall or short, whether you're dark or white, makes no difference. You think the black people in some other part of the world and the white people in some other part of the world, they suffer differently? No. When they experience loss, they suffer the same way as we do. Just like our, all our blood is the same color, all minds suffer the same way. Everyone experiences anger the same way. So in that way, we are all very similar. If you look past this external shell of ours, you won't, be, you won't begin to experience the differences that seem to be there that separate us. We are all united because we are all suffering from the same predicament. We are all there, we are all under the, in, on the same boat. All lost on a raft somewhere in the middle of the ocean. We're all looking for direction, somehow to get to the show. We're all looking for the same thing. So Asian or Caucasian matters not. Black or white matters not. European or Asian, it matters not. African or Mongolian, it matters not. We're all the same. Ultimately, we're all minds and all minds suffer because of ignorance. And all minds suffer because of attachment. Whether it is your mother or your father, whether it is you or your, your brother, your sister, they all suffer the same way. So when they are angry, their immediate response is, it is someone else who has made them angry. So therefore, you know, you need to learn to expect this from other people also. See, think about what I'm trying to explain to you here, ladies and gentlemen. Before you got the Dhamma, when you got angry, did you not think that it was someone else who was responsible for that? Yes or no? Yes. So, take the next person. Take, you know, your brother, your sister, okay? They're about the same age as you, maybe a few years difference, but they have not got the Dhamma yet. 
So when they are angry, who do you expect them to blame? Themselves or you? You. So if they are blaming you because they're angry, is that not the expected response? Should that not be the expected response from your end? It is, who, I mean, who else are they supposed to blame? Themselves? Why would they do that? Because they don't have the Dhamma. One must have the Dhamma to recognize that the problem's mine. The problem's mine and mine alone. Anger is, a, is an internally created mental vexation. They're not going to understand that until they have the Dhamma. So if you live amongst people who are yet to get the Dhamma, then you've got to understand that they are most definitely going to expect that the people who are responsible for their vexations are you. Don't expect anything else because causes give rise to results. If you expect any other result from someone who, has, who doesn't have the Dhamma, then again you're wrong. Because then again you're not seeing the world as a, as a series of causes and effects. You may not be so now because you are you're dealing with ignorance, you're dealing with attachment, you're, you're fighting them, you're coming out of them because the Dhamma is healing you. Fair enough. But don't expect the same from others. Don't expect that from your boss. Just because you are becoming a saint, don't expect that from your, your colleagues. You would be wrong, wouldn't it? If you expect that, then are you not simply demonstrating a lack of understanding of cause and effect? Hmm? If there's sugar somewhere, don't you expect there to be ants in a few minutes? If you're surprised by that, then you haven't understood what sugar is. That's when you're surprised. You put some sugar out there and there are ants all over the place. You know, how's that going? What's going on here? No, not what's going on here. It's, it's, if it's sugar, then there's going to be ants. It's to be expected. He who does not expect that is a fool. So if you don't expect people who are not in the Dhamma, who, people who are not practicing the Dhamma, to not be angry and then think that you are responsible for that, then who's the fool? Not them. I see a bigger fool. You've got to expect that from them, but you shouldn't be like that. What's the difference? Good people, bad people? Them and us? What's the difference? Ignorance. Ignorance and attachment, that is the only difference. Your ability to spot the real culprit here is a, is a grand victory. I cannot, I cannot emphasize this enough. It's a grand victory. It is the championship, honestly. I'm talking about what I'm going through. As I practice the Dhamma, how I begin to see the world. I can only share with you what I'm experiencing, what I'm going through, and what the Dhamma is doing for me. And therefore I know that, you know, when, whenever a vexation comes into the mind, I'm able to spot that, ah, it's coming from within. This is a creation within. No one else is responsible for that. That stops me from doing anything I will later regret. Isn't that a victory alone? Isn't that alone a victory? If you can all get there, if you haven't already, if you can all get there, don't you think that's a, a wonderful place to be? Where, whenever you, know, you're, you live with your children, your children make you upset. You're, they upset you, your wife upsets you, your husband upsets you, your neighbors upset you, your dog upsets you, the, you know, the little fish in the tank upsets you, you know, what, the, 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 the coffee stain upsets you, the button that comes off as you, as you start to button your shirt, that upsets you, the lace breaks, that upsets you. The tire, the flat tire upsets you, the engine doesn't start, that upsets you. The crow that flies over the, over the, you know, in the sky, you know, they, it takes a dump just right on your windscreen, that upsets you. The milk, it's gone off, that upsets you. The electricity board upsets you, the water board upsets you. Yeah? Everybody's there to upset you. It's like hell on earth. If you look at it that way, the tax collector, my God, don't get me started, right? They're all, they're all there to upset you. So if you look at it that way, there's no one out there to help you. There's no one's a friend, everyone's an enemy, because everyone's just there to upset you. 
So now, how, how do you start and where do you finish this, this problem? If everyone out there is there to upset you, now, you know, this is a, a never-ending battle. You have, to, you have a bone to pick with everyone. There are some people like that, have you not come across? They're just always so miserable. Ask them to name one good thing about the world, they're like, I wish I didn't meet you. I can't wait for the day I'm dead. There are people like that. They wish they were never born. There are people like that. There are people who wish they were never born. Because life has become so miserable for them. It's not the problem. It, the problem is it's not out there. That's the point. That's the point. It's the whole point. They are the losers. But they think everyone's out to get them. They feel victimized. They feel that all of nature, everyone out there, is just out there to get me and destroy my life and make my life miserable. There may be people in your families who are like that. Maybe a distant cousin, maybe an uncle, maybe an aunt. You know, she lives all by herself. She isolates herself. She doesn't know how to get along with everybody else because she thinks everyone in the family is out to get her. There are people like that. You need to understand that it is because of ignorance and have sympathy towards them. And make sure that you don't become like them. See, once you turn this, let's call it a problem detector, once you turn this problem detector towards yourself, you begin to realize how everyone around you is a blessing. No one's out to get you. Everyone's there to give you. If you, if, if you just become deserving of whatever they have to give. A cloudy sky is not out to get you, it's about to give you rain. You just have to accept it. A clear sky is not about to get you, it's prepared to give you a sunny day. You just have to accept it. But if you're miserable, if you think that everyone's just out to get you, there are some people who are always complaining about the weather. A common occurrence, especially in the European part of the world, when I remember when I went to the UK, there are three W's people say. They're always complaining about the weather, work, and women. They're always complaining about them, the three W's. You meet a man by the water cooler, he's always talking either about the weather, either about work, or about women. Always going on about them. They're always out to get me. But here we don't complain a lot about the weather because the weather doesn't fluctuate too much. But there you have the four seasons, right? Sometimes it gets very cold, sometimes it gets rather hot. <clears throat> it's out to get them. People make their lives miserable for themselves. You know, these are the victories that I want you all to achieve if you haven't already. And if you have, then enjoy. Become someone who has no fault finding to do out there. Become someone who has no problem with the world out there. When, uh, that's not to say that you have, you have become someone who doesn't vex at all. You know, that will come eventually. But it has to start with you recognizing that the vexations are all self-made. You go ask your teacher, you go, you know, something we talk about at the monastery a lot of the time. You go ask your teacher for something and the teacher says, no, you can't have it. If that causes you a vexation, you need to recognize that the problem is not with the teacher, it's with me. Now, you may have similar experiences. You will all have a teacher. At the monastery, if you are part of a program, you will be, you will be a teacher. Let's say you want to take some time off, you want to go, go somewhere. You want to do something different, maybe you want to take the day off. You go and ask your teacher, can I have the day off? The teacher says, no. And then you start to stress inside. You like, oh. <laughs> Why don't they look at it from my point of view? I'm not saying that the teacher is always right. Unless the teacher is the Buddha. I'm not saying the teacher is always right. What I'm saying is, if you are vexing because of what the teacher has said, that sentence is wrong. 
You can't vex because of what the teacher has said. It may be an inconvenience. That understandable. It can be an inconvenience. You know, if, for example, if you have carry a water bottle with you, it's convenient to have a water bottle so that you can go to a water dispenser, fill a bottle up and bring it with you and, and you know, take a sip from time to time when you need it. Will you go to your teacher and say, can I have a water bottle? He says, no. So how am I supposed to get my water? Whenever you need some water, go to the water decanter, which is two and a half miles away, and then take a sip and come back. Now that is a point not for vexation, but for inconvenience. Yes, understood. But without vexing, you've got to be able to argue your case. Without vexing. They are very different things. What is an inconvenience is not a vexation. It's not a cause of vexation. Vexation is entirely caused by attachment and ignorance. I need you all to empower yourselves to be able to spot that, identify that, recognize that, acknowledge that, the moment vexation strikes. If you are not there yet, get there ASAP. That is the first rung on the ladder to get to the top. It's the first step. You need to get there, folks. If you're not there yet, get there as soon as possible. It's like how soon a man would run out if the house was on fire. How soon would a man go and jump in the water if their head was on fire? Faster than that, I ask you to come to an understanding that when there's a vexation, because a man whose house is on fire, they don't commit karma, they just run out of the house and the house burns down. But if someone believes that the vexation is made outside, someone else is responsible for that, then they're going to retaliate. This is where most sins take place. Tell me how could anyone sin if they didn't believe that the cause of their vexation was external? What is the logic? I'll ask the question again. Can you explain to me how anyone could sin if they didn't believe that the cause of vexation was something an external, was an external factor? Could they? No. For any one of the ten unmeritorious deeds, or the ten sins, for any one of them to happen, any one of them, you have to believe that the cause of vexation is external. Yes or no? See, when the Buddha teaches us what the Buddha's asana is, he starts with saying, Sabha Papa Sakarana. So how can you get to Sabha Papa Sakarana if you believe the cause of your vexation is a matter outside. It is someone else who is causing it. It is something else who is causing it. If that is where your thinking is, then how can you ever achieve Sabbapapa Sakarana? You can't, because the vexation starts building within, and then you need to find answers to that. Remember, the mind does not, is not fussed. Either give me the Dhamma, or give me a path to freedom from vexation, as in Relief from vexation. Either Abhisankara or the Dhamma. The mind's not fussed. The mind will pay, take one or the other. It, what, the difference is what you offer the mind. If you give the mind the Dhamma, the mind will quite happily take the Dhamma. <coughs> yes, exactly. But if you don't give the mind the Dhamma, then the mind will have to resort to Abhisankara. Can you name one, one instance in your life where you've done something unmeritorious, where you thought the vexation that, that took place in your mind, the suffering that took place in your mind, the anxiety, the stress, the pain, the anguish, whatever you want to call it, was not caused by something out there? You can't, because all of them, you thought the problem was out there, so therefore you thought you had to go and address it, whether you slap someone, shout someone, squash something, whatever. So. Your journey on this path, ladies and gentlemen, is dependent. It's dependent on your acknowledging that whenever you have a suffering within, it is not caused by an external factor. I don't know whether you have achieved that stage yet. If you haven't, you had better get there as soon as possible. If you haven't got there yet, 
you are still a long way behind. That is not meant to discourage you, it's meant to encourage you. I ask you to get there as soon as possible. And for that, we learn the Dhamma. For that, we study the Dhamma. But simple things are enough, simple facts are enough for you to recognize this, this truth. You know, when someone, when someone says something, if that is the cause for suffering, then everyone should suffer. Everyone in the vicinity should suffer, right? Everyone who hears these words should suffer, but that is not so. Some do, some don't. For that to be true, then it cannot be in the words. It cannot be in what is said. It has to be in the way you process it. That processing happens internally, so therefore that suffering is caused internally. See, simple things like that are enough to, to understand this simple truth. <clears throat> so when you talk about mental illnesses, can you give me an example of one of them? Uh, anxiety, hmm. Yeah. So let's take anxiety for instance. Anxiety is a state of mind where you're always worried that something may or may not happen. Isn't that because you want a particular outcome? You're always anxious about something because you're, you expect a particular outcome for, for anything, right? Let's say, for example, you've got exams coming up, right? Someone can, can be anxious about that. You, 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 know, you, you get into a state of anxiety and, I mean, I'm not talking about just anxiousness. Most of us have that, but anxiety, this uh, mental condition can be where you get really stressed about it and sometimes, you know, it gets almost physical. Right? Then you start showing symptoms and then people need treatment. They go to the doctor for that. But then there are those who are in the same circumstances but they don't have this problem. Meaning, the same exam, they don't have this problem. Then there are those who have. If you, if you were to think that anxiety is a biological problem, this is how perhaps some schools of thought would think, maybe Western medicine, maybe psychology, they will think that there's, a, there's an aspect of the mind, there's an aspect of the body, that they both contribute to this. Right? That is one school of thought. What we have understood through the Buddha's teaching is anxiety can be healed by helping people recognize that it is caused by attachment to something. You see, let's, as I said, take the example of passing an exam or doing an exam and then you're, you, you have anxiety as a, as a result of that. When you want to do an exam, you want to get good results in that exam. You want to pass that exam. You want to maybe pass with flying colors. Perhaps your future depends on that. Perhaps the next milestone on your career depends on that. Now, therefore, you have an expectation that this has to happen in this particular way. If I do this exam, I need to get a good grade. I need to get good results. When you have that expectation in your mind, you can never have a peaceful moment because we are talking about a future that has not yet come and that future can come at any point and you're, oh, you're forever anxious of what that outcome might be because you're worried that that future that you expect might not, might not materialize. So therefore, you suffer. The way out of this problem is to let go of attachment, is to let go of the attachment that you have towards a particular outcome. If you can, let's talk about how that is possible and how you can do that secondary, but if you can do that, if you can let go of a particular outcome, of something that you're attached to, then what is the cause of anxiety? Why would you be anxious? What is the basis for that? Could you perhaps share with me an example, madam, of what maybe someone might have an anxiety for? You've answered your own question. No, I... Yes. 
See, you just said, if they fear that that might happen again. See, that's an expectation, isn't it? An expectation that a wish, a hope, a prayer that that might, that, 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 that unfortunate thing should not happen again. That's an expectation. So for as long as that expectation is there in the mind, now when it looks like a similar thing is about to happen, then you have fear. You become anxious. You get stressed. You get sometimes so stressed that people start showing symptoms physically. Without the Buddha Dhamma, there is hardly a cure for this, because this is absolutely, as you said, a mental problem. If it's a physical problem, you can give some drugs, you can fix them. A biochemical process may be responsible. But of course, when the mind is ill, the body reacts, because the, mind, the body is controlled, by and large, by the mind. So the, the mind is able to, to manipulate the body in, in many ways, right? The, the hormones and all sorts of things take place in the body as a response to the state of mind that you're in. So when the mind has an expectation on something, either for something to happen or for something not to happen, then there, there's a mental response, and that mental response is stress. This is the vexation that builds within. So when people, um, when people get stressed, it is because they want a particular outcome. When people get stressed at work, it's because they want to be able to do all their work as they're supposed to, as, uh, you know, as their boss would expect them to, as the customers would expect them to, to reach their targets and so on. If uh, uh, you know, a, a, a mother, perhaps a mother who's pregnant, right, she could get stressed. Maybe she could get anxious. Maybe she can have anxiety, clinically, because she's worried about her child. The child that she, that, that's still within her and she's about to deliver. Sometimes that could even lead to things like depression. Wherever you have this problem, if you go to the root cause of it, there's an expectation of something. An expectation is something the mind is attached to. The mind can't let go of it because the mind believes that achieving that, whatever it is, either for something to happen or something not to happen. When the mind is attached to that, the mind is not free. The mind begins to stress. The mind begins to worry. The mind begins to have fear. And then comes grief. And then comes sorrow. And all of these res internal responses to an expectation. So wherever the mind has expectations, whatever that might be, large or small, if you all have expectations about anything, that expectation is what keeps you from being happy is what would lead you, in some circumstances, to suffering, to stress, to worry, to fear, to grief, and so on. So all mental sufferings are ultimately rooted in an expectation of some sort. We expect things because we believe that that thing that we expect, or that outcome we expect, is the one that's, make, that's going to make us happy. In other words, you expect you expect an external entity, an external event, an external outcome to be the source of your happiness. In other words, you expect your happiness to come from the outside. Of course, anyone who believes that their suffering comes from the outside also believes their happiness comes from the outside. So they have to import happiness and export <laughs> suffering. This is what they do. But the Buddha's teaching is that both suffering and happiness are to be found within. The Buddha teaches of a, of a, of a happiness where you, you need not do anything to be happy. If you are suffering inside and you can terminate that suffering, then you are in a default state of happiness. That's the beauty of it. This is where happiness differs from the pleasure that people seek in a mundane world, in a mundane life. Out there, people have to do things to be happy, don't they? You've got to do something to be happy. You've got to watch TV. You've got to go see your friends. You've got to you know, go to a party. You've got to go to the beach. You've got to walk the dog. Right? You've got to look at the sky. You've got to you know, do, do whatever. Star, star gazing. People got to do things to be happy. 
You got to draw, sing, dance, watch TV, collect stamps, stickers, play sport. These are things that people do to be happy. You see, this happiness is a very limited kind of happiness because there's going to come a day where you're not able to do any of these things. Isn't this why people dread growing old? Think about it for a second. Why are a lot of old people in this day and age really so, you know, stressed and so, so, they're so miserable. I, I don't say all of them, but they are, you know, it's, there's a fair share of them. They're very miserable because they used to find their happiness by associating with their loved ones, with their families, with their children, but now they're no longer with them because they've got to go and live their own lives. They used to be able to travel the world. You know, whenever they needed to go somewhere, they would get themselves dressed, get in their car, drive and go. That's it. You needn't ask someone. You needn't get someone to do that for you. Right? You, you were independent. But as you grow older, what's going to happen? You lose your independence. Then you become dependent. And when you become dependent, now you, have, you are at the mercy of other people to satisfy you. Sir. I'm talking about, in, uh, yes, you could think of it that way, yes. So, individual chittas, because it's an individual chitta that either suffers or is happy, or an aggregate of chittas, if you talk about the mind as a phenomenon, okay? So, I, 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 you know, this is what happens with old people. I used to work in a care home, so I remember how, how much those people used to just, you know, just getting through the day was painful for them. Some of them wished they were dead. Because they, there comes a point in their life where everything that used to make them happy, they can no longer have with them. What happens when your eyes start going blind? Then you can't even watch TV. You can't go out to the garden and watch your flowers, look at your flowers, look at the birds. You can't, you can't sightsee. All of that stops. When your legs stop working, you can't get around. But then you need a walking stick. You need a Zimmer frame. Right? You use that and walk around as far as you can. But then in a few years after that, then even that goes away and then you become immobile. Then the things that used to make you happy, they have to bring to you. So therefore the TV has to be there. Then when there's a power cut, what do you do? Now you can't go out. The TV is not working. No one's there to phone. No one, no one wants to take your call because you know, you're know you old. People, you don't find the same things interesting as the young people do. You're of a different generation now. Uh, the things that make young people interested, they, they, it doesn't interest you. Things that interest you, it doesn't interest the young, younger generation. So they don't want to talk to you. You know, we, we are all on that journey. Parents, there's, there's going to come a point where your children are no longer going to find you interesting. Face up to that. You're going to have to learn to live with that. So if you are today happy because you have your children with you, there's going to be a day where they're going to say, goodbye, mommy, I'll see you next year. <laughs> and then maybe you'll be left alone. You're just you and your husband, you and your wife. Then when one of them passes away, soon after the other one does. Most families, that is so. Why? Because the only source of happiness, the only flame that kept them alive, when that burns out, now, where's the hope to carry on? <laughs> Expectation keeps the heart alive. Hope keeps you going. Hope of a better future. Hope of a better outcome. Hope of something to happen to you in the future. Therefore, they are, no, they, they are never internally satisfied. Always expecting that the next knock on the door is going to make, be someone that's going to make them happy. Always expecting that the next meal is the thing that's going to make them happy. Always expecting that the next bouquet of flowers is the thing that's going to make them happy. The next song is going to make them happy. The next thing that they put in their mouths is going to make them happy. Always expecting. So they are never happy because they are always expecting. When someone's always expecting, how can they be happy? Because expectation is not a state of happiness. Expectation is a state of vexation. This is why I ask you the question, would it be nice if every day was Christmas Eve? Not Christmas Day, Christmas Eve. You see the presents around the Christmas tree, but you can't open them. Every day is Christmas Eve. No? So we have New Year's coming up, right? In a couple of weeks' time. Just imagine if every, year, every day was New Year's Eve, 
So you can see, you know, in the in the bedroom, in the living room, they've got the presents, right? They're all gifts wrapped up, you know, it's got your name on it. You've been asking for something from your folks and they've got it ready for you, but every day is New Year's Eve. So you never get to the day where you can actually have your presents. Now that is expectation. You don't want that. When they leave you on a cliffhanger, why do you tune in the following week to watch the next episode? Because you don't like the state of vexation. You want to be relieved of that vexation. Of course, when there's pressure building up, you need somehow to be relieved of that pressure. I mean, for how long do you want to keep doing this? <laughs> Why do you put yourself through this misery? So if a, if, a, if a mother expects that it is her child who keeps her happy, what's going to happen to her the day that the child dies? Mothers always think that, you know, I'm going, my child is going to survive me. This is an expectation, a hope that mothers have. It's like they get to choose who goes first. But that is not so. You know, when a mother, when a mother, when a, when a woman chooses to become pregnant, does she ever consider the possibility of a miscarriage? Talk to her about that, she'd, you know, she'd like, my God, wash your mouth, get lost. For someone who speaks of something like saying that's an ill or bad omen, like, chase them away. Don't even talk about them. Bring a cartaria. <laughs> They don't even like to talk about things like that. It's like when you cross the road, you never think that you're going to get run over. Just think about the risks you take as you cross the road. You know, someone pulls up, right? Just think, someone's about to turn, turn into, the, into a side road, and then they usher you along. Right? This is a car that has not been parked through pulling the handbrakes. Someone just got their foot on the brake. You so bravely walk across. You know, your life is now dependent on someone choosing whether they take their foot off the pedal or not. And you're okay with that. Because you never think of an undesirable outcome to happen to you. But you are very good at giving advice to other people, just as I'm doing right now. <laughs> this is all because of jati. Because when jati happens in the mind, you have a sense of self. When you have a sense of self, a sense of self-preservation comes to you out of instinct. You always wish, you always expect the best to come to you. It's characteristic of the self. Always expecting the best to, come, to happen to you. I'm not suggesting that women who wish to become mothers should not. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm saying is consider the possibility that you might lose your child during pregnancy, and prepare yourself for that. See, you prepare yourself for when the child is born. You paint the rooms, you bring the cot. Uh, even before the child is born, sometimes you start thinking about what schools you're going to put them into. Right? You might even relocate yourself to somewhere that's in the vicinity of a good school. People do this sort of thing. It's okay. So you, you're preparing for the desirable outcome. What about the undesirable outcome? I'm not saying, you know, as you buy a cot, also buy a coffin. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, prepare yourself mentally. Don't you think this room should be full of pregnant mothers? Now, that's not saying go become. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, you know, shouldn't pregnant mothers be, be talked to? So that they don't, they don't lose their minds if they lose their child? You know, why lose another life? Just because one life is lost. So they need the Dhamma. Because a mind is a mind is a mind is a mind. As I said, you know, whether you're black or white, man or woman, a mind is a mind and all minds vex the same. All minds experience fear the same. All minds experience grief the same. All minds experience a sorrow the same. Because they all suffer because of the same causes. Attachment is always the cause. Now, I want you to start thinking about your own lives. Now, this is a good lecture. But you need to start thinking about how these words affect you. Where are you right now? In your lives. What are the pain points that you have? 
What are the vexations that are about to happen to you? Where are, where's the next fear going to come to you from? Where's the next grief going to come to you from? Where's the next sorrow going to come to you from? How do you know? You don't have to wait for it. Think about what you're attached to today. That's where it's going to come from. If you feel more than duty bound to your husband, then do expect for you to lose your mind when he says goodbye for the last time and shuts his eyes for the last time. If you are more than duty bound to him. By duty we are all bound to each other, of course. By duty a teacher is bound to the student. By duty a doctor is bound to the patient. By duty a mother is bound to her child. But it's not just that, is it? A mother feels that there's a very special connection between the two of them. A mother feels love towards her child. Motherly love is what kills the mother. You know this as mothers. It's what kills you. From the day the child was born, how many moments were you happy versus how many moments were you, did you live in fear? When you send your child to school, until your child returns from, returns from school, you live in fear. What if someone does something to them? What if someone gropes them? What if someone gives them something, drugs or a toffee or something that they shouldn't be having? What if someone teaches them bad manners, bad habits? What if someone teaches them swear words? What's going to happen? What if my child gets attacked? But you brought the child into this world because you wanted to be happy. Where's that happiness now? And if something does happen, then from that point you live in sorrow. Because you've lost the thing that you wanted. Where's that peace of mind now? I'm not saying that people should not become mothers. I, I, I say people should. If, you, if, you're not, if Nibbana is not something that you are keen on just now, then becoming a mother, there's no problem with that. Then you can send your child to Nibbana. Someone sends Nibbana. <laughs> doesn't have to be you. Someone does. Because, you know, it's just, it's just someone has to be seated in these seats. doesn't have to be you. That sounds so mean, doesn't it? From your perspective, it sounds very mean. Yes. When I say that these seats have to be occupied, not necessarily by you. That sounds very mean, I know. But that is the truth. Nibbana has to happen to somebody. That's all. Whether that somebody is you, who decides? Can I decide that? No, you've got to decide that. So you know, there's a whole world of people out there, 8 billion of us. Of that, a few hundred of us are striving for Nibbana. It's your duty to consider yourself either one of this hundred or one of the 8 billion. That is not my choice. That's your choice. Just as everyone has the right to attain Nibbana, everyone has the right to suffer. And I am not one to take away your rights from you. I wouldn't want to do that. Otherwise I'll be summoned by the Human Rights Court. But, you know, honestly, folks, I, I need you to start thinking about it. I know you've already started, but I need you to think more about this course. Right from our youthful years, from our very young years, right, people have been putting all sorts of nonsense into our heads particularly the fact that our happiness is dependent on what other people do, what other things, you know, what things that go on out there, what other people say and so on. So we lived, uh, you know, we've been living in a fool's paradise. Honestly. You know this is true because you're now beginning to reflect on these words and you realize, my gosh, yes, it is true. We've been living in a fool's paradise. You've, you surrounded yourself with lots of things that you thought were going to bring you happiness, but every single time you did that, all you did was you surrounded yourself that was going to bring you either fear or grief. When did you actually enjoy the possessions that you have? You know, that watch that you wear on your wrist, when do you actually get to enjoy it? How often do you check the time versus how often do you live in fear that someone might snatch it from you or that it might break? You know, in a day, how many times do you check the time? Do you check it every hour? No. Then maybe you check it three times, four times, a few times a day. Right? But every moment you wear it on your wrist, 
and you're in the bus, you're in the train, you fall asleep. You can't fall asleep now. If you're stood in the bus, you know, with your hand up here, holding the, 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 the whatever the thing you call it, and right now you start dozing, you start falling asleep. You're, you're worried, you can't, you can't fall asleep. Because who knows, if the next time you wake up, your watch is gone. You got your wallet in your, in your purse, or in your pocket rather. The next thing you know, the wallet is gone. You need not put yourself through this fear, because that is not what you were born human for. So, if you wish to become a mother, wish you become a mother, but also prepare yourself, not only for the desirable outcome, but also for the undesirable outcome. Because when that happens, who's there to fight your corner? Who's there to speak on your behalf? Because once the mental vexation strikes you so intensely, it's very difficult to come out of it. It's like once you're in the pit, if you hadn't given put yourself a ladder before you went into the pit, now how do you get out? Isn't it? If you want to get out of a pit, before you jump, what must you do? First put the ladder in there. What if you realize that there's no ladder after you're in the pit? Yeah. Now you have to rely on someone else to put one in there. What if no one comes? <laughs> what if no one's interested? What if they're all very busy? They're far too busy trying to get out of their own pits. That's what I'm saying. If you wish to become a mother, first of all, prepare yourself for the undesirable outcome. If you wish to get married, prepare yourself for the undesirable outcome. That's exactly what I'm saying, yes. You know, I'm speaking to an audience who have had the opportunity, who have had the good merits to come across the Dhamma, right? What I'm asking you to do is to keep, is keep yourselves on this path. Don't stray. Keep yourselves on this path. You know, just because, say, for example, you've become a monk. I speak to the monks, so the rest of you can figure out from this. Just because you've become a monk doesn't mean you're going to die a monk. What if the day comes you think, you know what, this life is not for me. Oh, how I wish all those pleasures that I used to have. My wife. I wonder who she's with right now. I have to go back and make sure that she's fine. Can't that day ever come? It's possible, if you don't keep yourself in the Dhamma. Monks, they become monks by putting on a robe, and they become lay people by taking off the robe. <laughs> Quite simple. Robing and disrobing is just a matter of minutes. You, you observe the Samanera Dasasila, you become a monk. You observe the Pansil, you become a lay person. Simple as that. So just because you have become a monk doesn't mean you're going to die a monk. Then just because you have become an Anagarika, or an Anagarika, or a Sila Savaka, or a Sravika, or a Nuesi, whatever, you don't, it's no guarantee that you're going to be there. Just because you're an Upasaka doesn't mean you're going to be one for the rest of your life. You have to be with the Dhamma. So just because you're here, Today doesn't mean you're going to be here tomorrow. Remember, these are individual chittas. There's no you and I here. They're individual chittas. You have a responsibility towards the next chitta that is about to arrive. That's about to arise in your mind. You are responsible just as a father is responsible for the well-being of their child, or the child to, to come. Just as the grandparents is responsible for their father, the father responsible for the child, and the child for the grandchild, and so on. You are responsible for the next chitta that is to be born in your mind. So therefore, do what you need to do so that the next chitta can be an arahat pala chitta. Do what you have to do for that. For that, you've got to keep yourself with the Dhamma. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking in the context, like, what if there's something that's both, like, even going back you know, to mental illness, like things like schizophrenia or anxiety, like, people take medication to go to chemicals and balance it all. And then, you know, that does help regulate, like, mm. physiologically, which helps mentally. So, is, isn't that something that can be used both? Yes, absolutely. So, take hunger, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, an example that we can all relate to. 
Hunger has a physical element to it and a mental element to it. So hunger is not purely physical. Because when you when when your stomach is empty and the and the gastric juices start to start digesting the internal walls, then you, you begin to experience hunger. You know the hunger there are receptors there that indicate that you're hungry. But that hunger is felt mentally. It's your mind that perceives hunger. But the hunger is actually there in the stomach, but you perceive hunger in your mind. So there's a physical problem there as well as a mental problem. Now, there are those who are hungry and then they become angry. A hungry man? There you go. Not every man. Not every hungry man is an angry man. There are those for whom hunger does not bother them. There are those for whom hunger does not take away their happiness because their happiness is not dependent on them, on them not being hungry. But then there are others, the majority, when they are angry, no. When they are hungry, they are angry. So when you are hungry, you have got to feed yourself. Yes, that's a physical problem, so you have to feed yourself. Also goes on arms, they feed themselves. Now, so if in, 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 in the same way, there can, be, there can be medical conditions where there's a physical aspect to it, there's a mental aspect to it, there are hormonal changes, there are all sorts of biochemical changes that, that contribute towards a state of mind and vice versa. So therefore, you need to support them by helping them restore their chemical balance by you know, giving them drugs, giving them some kind of treatment, whatever. But mental vexation is never, I say never, caused by any physical component, imbalance, or any other configuration of your physical bodies. Never. It is always a mental disposition. Always. So there are those, I mean, take a simple example. You know, there are some patients, right? so take a cancer patient, for example. Right? There are some who are able to handle themselves in a very mature way, with or without the Dhamma. Let's take someone without the Dhamma. Right? They are able to handle themselves in a, in a very mature way. They say, yeah, I know I'm going to die in, say, the next three months, but I'm, I'm prepared for that. Right? And, but, you know, there's, there are the pains, there are the aches, right? The, the chemotherapy is just killing me from inside, but it's, it's very difficult. But, you know, I, I'm able to face up to the challenges. So, they, you know, they're mentally, they're strong. I, I'm talking about someone without the Dhamma, you know, in a mundane way. Then there are those who, you know, it doesn't take a cancer for them to, to, to lose their peace of mind. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's just, a, you know, a flock of gray hair. That's enough. And, and they lose their cool. Just a gray hair, that's enough. So there's a physical aspect, there's a mental aspect. The physical aspects where they are, like hunger, you've got to feed. So food helps the physical problem. Clothing, physical problem. Shelter addresses the physical problem. And medicines address the physical problem. That's why we call it the siupase. The four requisites. Even we as monks and arahatam monks, we are all dependent on the four requisites because we have a physical body that has to be sustained and maintained by resorting to the four requisites. But the Buddha, the Buddha's purpose of preaching the Dhamma is to heal the mind. And the mind has nothing to do with the four requisites. The mind suffers because of ignorance, because of attachment. I can't ensure, or I can't assure all of you that until your last breath you will always have the four requisites. I can't give you any guarantee of that, can I? Because I may not be there. You may not have what you need. You may not always have the food that you need. You may not always have the shelter that you need. You may not always have the medicines that you need. Maybe you develop a, a, a medical condition for which a remedy has not yet been found. Maybe you are the first in all of humanity, you're the first person to, to, to ever contract that disease. Maybe you have a genetic disease, and for which there's no cure. Now, I can't guarantee that you will not physically suffer because of that. My, my parents, some of my family, right, they, they physically suffer a lot, because now old age is picking, you know, getting on them. 
back aches and uh, all sorts of aches from head to toe they have uh, you know you call my dad <laughs> he's got something to complain about because the old age is just you know getting on him now but what i can do is i can give him the dhamma so that the physical aches remain as physical aches they don't bring him down mentally they don't bother him mentally it is possible for that to happen it is possible to achieve that state because your mental suffering is always rooted in mental attachment there's no such thing called physical attachment well, there is physical attachment but it is in mental attachment mental attachment is caused because is caused by your desire for things your attraction towards things your wanting for things the the mental allure for things if you can break that bond and that happens through the dhamma anicca dukkha anatta is here to help you with that if you can break that bond then you are free let's take a simple example we've got a little bit more time now let's say you have um a favorite object and say uh, something that you like the color of okay okay say uh, a dress you really like the like like the color so that's why you bought it and you're really atta- attached to that it's not necessarily just the just the the shape of it you're actually attached to the color of it you like it in that color i mean when you go shopping don't you find times where you go do you not have it in another color if it's just the design then what matters why why does the color matter then right? you ask for do you not have it in a, another color so you like the color see you buy it and now you're attached to it because it's of a, a large part of your attachment <clears throat> excuse me your attraction to this object is because of the color what the dhamma teaches you is that color is not in the object i mean science can do that as well to some extent but there's there's a degree that science can go to and beyond that you need the mind for this because what science will tell you is there are pigments in these objects and when you're looking at an object it is that object's color that you see but what the, what buddhism can help and you <coughs> excuse me help you understand is these are manifestations and seeing color is a process so the color itself is not in the object so then once you understand this and i'll prove it to you in just a moment when you understand that color is not an inherent characteristic of an object but your attachment to the object is say 50% of that is because of the color now what what is the cause for your attachment what, what you know what is the rationale for your attachment what is the logic for your attachment when you recognize that color is not in the object color is a, is a creation in the mind the mind creates color so when the mind creates color it creates a colorful world but then you start to attach to things because you think that color comes from the object you think color is in the object you think this is red when you think this is red and then you like a red duster you want this so therefore you will take this you will acquire this and once it's yours you will now have to protect it because there are also others who believe that this is red so they will want to take it from you but you won't let them have it because you want to have it because your happiness is dependent on this but what if you come what if there comes a day where you understand that there is no such thing as a red duster redness is in the mind this is just a duster <coughs> that helps you work on your attachment that helps to start eradicate attachment Do you have that video you can put on please? Not the video the uh, the color wheel. <clears throat> I'll show you in just a moment just to prove to you the point that color is a creation of the mind. It is not out there in objects. But people attach to things because they think it's in the object. What do you see? it's a ring of purple dots isn't it but if you focus on the cross in the middle you'll start seeing something that's not actually out there yeah where's the green coming from 
Now try and spot the green. Try and actually catch the green, look at the green, and it's gone. Yeah? So where's the green then? There is no green here, but don't you see a green? That's because your mind is playing tricks on you. That's, that's what I say, color is a creation of the mind, it's not out there. I have proved to you, it's not out there. But you see green nonetheless. Now let me just imagine if you said, I like this because it's green. Wouldn't that be nonsensical to say that? You say, I like this leaf because it's green. Is it green? Then why do you like it now? But well, it's not green anymore, so why do you like it? No, actually, no, I don't, want, I don't want it. I'm, not, I'm no longer attached to it, because it's not green. Like I said, you, know, you, go to, you go shopping, you buy a dress, and you say, don't you have it in another color? Don't you have it in green? <laughs> what the shopkeeper should say is, take it home, and you think it's green. That'll do. So why pay extra for green? You know, just think, they said, right, we have it in white, and it's a thousand bucks. It comes in green, but it's two thousand. Aren't you willing to pay the extra thousand and buy it in green? But where's the green? The green's in your mind. So why pay the extra thousand? I'll give you another example. Shall we show the other one as well, please? Yes. Have you seen her? This is a few Janagarika. <laughs> what do you see? You see a picture of a girl, right? It's, it's like a negative image of a photograph, right? What I want you to do is focus on the nose and don't look anywhere else until I say so. Just stare at the nose and her beautiful teeth. No, just look at the nose. Right? I'll tell you when to stop. When I ask you to stop, what I want you to do is to look away and start blinking as fast as you can. When I say so. So for now you're staring at the nose. When I tell you, you got to stop, look away, and blink as fast as you can. At the count of three. One, two, three. You got to blink. Now what do you see? Hmm? You see the girl, but do you see it just like this? Now what do you see? A beautiful girl. Colourful, right? So where are those colours coming from? Is it in the picture? It's not. So if it's not in the picture, then why do you like a girl who's fair? Why do you look for a fair girl? Why do you look for a dark girl? Why do you look for a girl who has a, you know, red, red lips, rosy cheeks? Why do you like that? If it's not in the girl? There aren't these questions that we should ask ourselves. The rosiness of the cheeks are not in the cheeks. The redness of the lips are not in the, red, in, in the lips. But when someone comes up to you, you know, they've done their makeup and you look at them and go, wow, my God, she's, she's the epitome of beauty. And you think that the beauty is, is in the girl. So now you want her. Then you want to take her home with you. Then you want to put a ring on it and keep her for yours, for yourself. But the problem is this, you're not the only one who felt that way. There are others who also wanted her. Now what's, what's going to happen? Fear. Why? What if someone else takes her? See, fear. And then somehow, either someone else takes her or death takes her. In other words, time takes her. Then. You're in grief. So while you have her with you, you are in fear. 
When you lose her, you're in grief. When did you actually enjoy being with her? <laughs> when you weren't attached to her. Ultimately, when you weren't attached to her. That is the only time you actually enjoyed. This is how today I'm able to enjoy everything in this world. You're only able to enjoy half of this world. Because you'll have a favorite color. Because you have a favorite color, everything else does not bring you the same, same amount of joy. Your, the thing that has your favorite color brings you joy, but not the rest of it. But if you can become someone who does not have a favorite color, it's not someone who doesn't see color. Okay, this is not about going color blind. You see color, but you understand that color is a fabrication of the mind. Therefore, you don't, you don't have an attachment to the object because of its color. If you can get yourself to that state, now let the objects be. You use them for what is there. You use a pen to write, you use a dress to, to wear, right? You, eat, you, you use food to eat. But, but think about all the, the, the dressings that people do, you know, to, 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 to color their food and all sorts, you know, papa dumps. Like those days you used to only come in one color, but now you have all sorts, don't you? Like you take green papadums and orange papadums, red papadums and yellow papadums and all sorts. But the color is not in the papadum. But people are, you know, if you had a choice, you might take the one that is, that is colorful. But why? Because color is not there. When color is not in the, in the food, why do, you, why do you pick that color? Why do you pick that food? Why do you pay extra for that? Yeah. This is because of ignorance again. So because of ignorance, ultimately people suffer. They have to pay extra because of ignorance. Isn't ignorance a heavy price? Aren't you paying a heavy price for ignorance? You have to pay extra. To pay extra, you have to earn extra. To earn extra, you have to be at work extra. If to be at work extra, you have to be away from your family extra. Therefore, ultimately, you have to stop doing the things you really enjoy doing and do things that you have to do because your mind is vexing. This is the plight that people who have no understanding of the Dhamma find themselves in. Of course, because they are far too busy running around trying to relieve themselves of vexation that they don't have the time to actually come and get some treatment. <laughs> Just imagine if someone had diarrhea. There's a guy who has diarrhea. He's constantly Leaking, that's the word, yes. He's constantly leaking. So you say, go to the doctor, get some treatment. No, I can't, I'm leaking. Right? So he has to run to the toilet. Every time he thinks, I will go to the toilet, to, not to the doctor, he has to run to the toilet. So he has no time to go to the doctor. He hasn't, he hasn't a moment's opportunity to go to the doctor because he always has to go to the toilet because he's leaking. Don't you think people are like that? Most people? They don't have time to come to the temple even on a poya day, to listen to a sermon, to help them eventually come out of this problem of mental vexation because they are far too busy relieving themselves of vexation. This is the story of their life. You, on the other hand, are very fortunate and very meritorious to have had the opportunity to come across the teaching of the Buddha to at least begin to realize that there is something more we need to be doing with our lives. Most of you have already done and you've come a long way, you've committed yourself to this course. There are some who may be first-timers. There will be those who will be first-timers online today. There will be some who are only just starting to make, you know, take baby steps on this path. But ultimately, you know, we all have the same, same lives that we live and at the end, we are all going to leave this earth as empty-handed as we came in. None of the pursuits that we went after are going to come and save us. Not all the money in the bank is going to save you from your misery at the point of your death. Not all the children that you have are going to save you when you feel you are all alone in this world in those last few moments. And it doesn't have to be the last few moments, like I said, once you become old, you become an invalid. Just wait a few more years and see whether what I'm saying is not true. You become an invalid. Because society will have taken all use that they have of you, and then you just become a bit of a, like a, a used tissue paper. 
is an invalid. Once you wash and wipe your hands, you throw it in the bin. Hmm? You become trash. <laughs> you, you're all heading there. You become trash. Because, you know, these physical bodies, they, c they can't sustain forever. They can't keep going forever. But the mind, if it's not trained, it's not, if it's not tamed and it's not trained, the mind will continue to vex. So when the mind wants something, but the body is not ready now, the body is not prepared, the body is not capable any longer to give what the mind wants, my gosh, can you just imagine that state? You know, today you don't feel this, ladies and gentlemen, because when you want to go to the toilet, you can pick yourselves up, get on your, those legs and go to the toilet. But there's going to come a day where you can't do that. And on that day, you're going to be at the mercy of those around you, and you had better keep them interested in you, so that they will stick around. But your jokes are not going to be funny forever. The stories that you have to say are not going to be interesting forever. You have old stories, they were new stories. The things that interest you are not going to interest them forever. You're going to be the older generation, then they're going to be the new generation. Then who's going to be there for you? Like I said, I can't stop any of this from happening for you or assure you that when you are old, someone's going to be there to look after you. Now, you might die, you know, on the side of the road. Who knows? That's not the problem. That is not the problem. Who cares what happens to you physically, you know, in the last part of your life because you're going to die anyway? Right? This body is going to go back to the soil anyway, right? So who cares how it dies? Who cares whether you are shot to death or sliced to death? Who cares? Whether you have a natural death or you are poisoned to death? Who cares? What matters is not that. What matters is are you mentally prepared for that? The physical suffering is very temporary. You know you are not going to suffer because of old age as soon as you are dead, right? You know that. Or the only, you, know, you only have to endure the pain of a bad back or the pain of a bad... A bad leg or, a, or the pain of a bad hip for as long as you're alive after that you no longer have to suffer from that but then you're born again and then you have to go through the same thing again that rebirth happens because you have unfinished business in other words you have you are still looking for happiness from the outside world this is why people are reborn another chance to try and achieve happiness because you expect happiness to come from the outside world so if happiness has to come from the outside world, of course you have to be reborn. What other solution do you have? Let's go ask God, why did you create rebirth? Well, God would say, because you're looking for happiness on the outside. So if you're looking for happiness on the outside, you have to be reborn once you're dead. Why? <laughs> so you can find it. Of course. But once, one, once you realize that happiness is within, now why do you need to be reborn? Why do you need to be born again? If you recognize that happiness is within, you need to not do anything to be happy, your default state of mind is happiness, then you are happy, aren't you? If you are happy, if you are content, if you are fulfilled, why do you need to be born again? There is no reason for it, no, no logic, no rationale. Therefore, you are not born again. Simple as that. But if you are born again, if you are born human again, you have got to go through all this again. Go back to scholarships. <laughs> Go back to grade 5, go back to all of us, go back to your A levels, you've got to do the whole thing again if you're born human. That's if you're born human. That's if you're born human. Forgive me for saying this. Ladies, you know the problems that you have that we men don't have, right? How many times now have you had to go through that? Month on month. Don't you feel pity for yourselves? All because you want to be here. All because you want to see what's out there. All because you want to hear what's out there. All because you want to taste food. You want to experience the joy that you think comes from the outside. Is this worth the price? Twenty years, thirty years, sometimes forty years for some people. They have to go through it month on month. I have a mother, so I know what this must be like. When I wanted to study medicine at school, I, I decided, resolved for myself, you know, I'm going to find a cure to stop all these pains and uh, to stop women from having to suffer when they have this problem every month. 
That, that is why I want to do medicine, one reason. When I was younger, I determined I'm going to stop it somehow. Because I didn't want my mother to go through that. Would any son want their mother to go through that pain? It's a pain that they can't help do anything about. What can you do about it? You have to go through it. If you are born, you have to go through it. Men, what if you are born in women, in your next birth? Then? You have to go make a living, you have to go do a job, you've got to get, to get told off and you know, have all the cuts and the bruises and the toothaches and the headaches and the neck aches and the leg aches and the, everything you have to go through again. You've got to go through old age again. You've got to go through the sleepless nights again. You've got to go through the fear again. Everything you feared in this birth, you're going to have to go through again. It's not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth it. Come to your senses, please. It's not worth it. Today we have a chance to bring a stop to all this. What are you waiting for? Today we have an opportunity to stop, put a stop to all this. To stop mental vexation once and for all. When the mind doesn't vex, the mind doesn't look, doesn't wait for the next opportunity to relieve itself from vexation. When that is no longer a necessity, the mind does not need to be reborn. It's the mind that is reborn and then it looks for a body to carry it around as a vessel. That's the connection between mind and body. When you die in this birth, all that happens is the mind is separated from the body. Because that body can no longer be sustained, it returns to nature. Now the mind needs to go look for another body. Sometimes it comes in the form of a spirit, sometimes it goes into the four great hells, and suffers because of the things that it had done while it was still alive. Sometimes it goes to the heavens, sometimes it's born a human again. But either way, the mind is still vexing. <laughs> vexing, 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 vexing. So come embrace the Dhamma. This is the only, this is the only medicine that you need. This is the only thing that is worth doing if you're alive. Are you alive? Are you alive? Well, this is the only thing that's worth doing if you're alive, I tell you. You have a body, unfortunately, so therefore you have to do something to sustain your bodies. Right? If you came without a body, wouldn't that be great? We wouldn't need to put the chairs here, we didn't need to put the air cons here, we didn't need to put the lights here, we, didn't need, we wouldn't need any of this. We wouldn't need to cook food for you. Right? We wouldn't need to do any of that. You don't need security, you don't need a vehicle to get here. If you were just a mind, you could just come, listen to the Dhamma and get your done, job done. But can't do it that way. That's why when we take people on, we have to put an age limit. See how, how unfortunate that is. You think we enjoy doing that? How unfortunate it is that we have to say, Anagarikas, 40 or minus, not above that. You think we enjoy doing that? I can't take my mother on today as an Anagarika. She's too old. Why? Because she comes with a body. If she was just a mind, no problem. Why does one want to become an Anagarika? Because you have noble association constantly, constantly noble association. You can't look left before, without someone asking you, why did you look left? Then you look right. You can't start do look right without someone asking you, why do you look right? You can't look down without someone asking, why do you look down? So your intentions are always questioned to ensure that you always have the right intentions because you can only be responsible for your intentions. So there's always teachers guiding you. Make sure your intentions are right. Make sure your intentions are pure. You can look wherever you want, provided you are doing it with the right intentions. You're not doing it to relieve yourself of vexation because relieving of vexation is not an answer. Every time you relieve yourself of vexation, you are just digging that hole one level deeper. Every time you do that. But the world out there, when you want to watch TV, what do people do? They just switch on the TV and start watching it. I know this goes against acceptable norms because you know people will come and ask what's 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 the problem with watching a bit of tv is that so harmful is that so is that against the law no it's not <laughs> but you watch tv because the mind vexes 
Watching TV is not the answer because the more you watch it, the more you begin to attach to it, the more you begin to vex, the more relieving from it becomes pleasurable and the more you will keep look, going after it. That's why we don't have a TV at the monastery. Not because we can't afford one. If we asked our devotees, they'd be more than happy to bring their home TV and install it at the monastery. <laughs> but we don't have one because watching TV is not the answer to wanting to watch TV. Is it? Eating ice cream is not the answer to wanting to eat ice cream. Going on a trip is not the answer to wanting to go on a trip. Listening to music is not the answer to wanting to listen to music. None of these are the answers. But ask the next Tom, Dick or Harry you meet on the way out. When you want to eat ice cream, what must you do? There's an ice cream parlor. I know a good one. <laughs> Shall we go? That's the answer you get. <coughs> they will never give you the right answer because they don't know themselves. How can the blind lead the blind? Out of darkness. But it's a case of the blind leading the blind. That is why this noble association is so critical and so crucial and so fundamental to once practice and journey to Nibbana. You are all so fortunate to be here today. I mean, that's why I say, you know, I think most of these words are to the people who watch these sermons online, on the camera, on YouTube, wherever these things get posted. You don't know what's here until you come and experience it. Don't fall into the trap to think that I can do whatever you guys do here at home. It doesn't work like that. It's not the same thing. If it were, you only need the double triple, double gem, you don't need the triple gem. Buddha and Dhamma is enough, you don't need Sangha. That's not, then why did the Buddha establish the Sangha? Why did he establish the order? You are all part of that order. The community, that community is essential. You don't see the log in your eye, do you? But you, spec, you see the speck in your brothers. So you need others to tell you where you're wrong, where you need help, where you need to do something differently, where to remind you, here's a place where I saw you waxing, you had better apply the Dhamma. That is why this community is so essential to our practice. You have no idea how grateful I am that we have this community, not just our monks, but our Anagarika Mahathas, our Anagarika Mahathmyas, our Srila Shravikas, our Uesis, our Shravakas and our devotees, all dedicated to one cause and one cause alone. That is Nibbana. Everyone here is, is here for that purpose. We're all thinking about Nibbana. We're all dedicated to Nibbana, committed to Nibbana. We are fanatical about Nibbana. That's all we want. Nibbana, Nibbana, Nibbana. If there's no Nibbana, then I don't even want to live. What's the point? What's the point of vexing and vexing and vexing and vexing only to die again and then born again and just vex again? What's the point? What a useless life that is. <laughs> what a useless life. That's why to me today, sorry again for saying this, I, it feels like a lay life is a useless life. Again, not meant to offend anyone. I look back at my past. My past was a useless life. Day on day on day in. I just spend one day after the other, just live the day, and then come to the end of that, wake up the following day, come to the end of that, wake up the following day, come to the end of that, just keep going on until you're dead. And then, start again. Eat, sleep, drink, repeat. <laughs> that's like a, you know, that's what happens when a virus gets into a computer. It's just, just the same procedure and repeat repetitively. This is the virus. If you have to eat tomorrow as well, what's the point of eating today? Huh? Honestly, if you have to eat tomorrow also, what's the point of eating today? Eat today if tomorrow you don't have to eat again. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you though? Do you understand exactly what I mean? Eat today if tomorrow you don't have to eat again. Sleep today if tomorrow you don't have to sleep again. Otherwise these things, you know, no, there's no meaning to it. Don't you wish you didn't have to brush your teeth? Who here enjoys brushing their teeth? Huh? I wake up every morning so I can brush my teeth. 
who here <laughs> enjoys brushing their you don't but don't you have to do it what's the point because you have to brush it again you know before you go to bed you brush your teeth right what's the point tomorrow morning you have to brush it again what's the point you know if that's how i feel about brushing my teeth <laughs> If you'd ask me, if you proposed to me, Swami Nanda, why not lay life again? <laughs> what do you think I might have to say? But this is not saying just because I'm a monk, I'm going to get to Nibbana. That is not so. That's what I said at the beginning of the sermon. Just because you are a monk today doesn't mean you're going to be a monk tomorrow. You have to be with the Dhamma. The Dhamma is the only remedy to the mind's wantings. The mind's needs, the mind's desires, the mind's vexation, the mind's never-ending search for happiness. Never-ending. Because it's not out there. I ask you once again. I'm going, I'm going to start walking around the loom, room looking for my glasses. Where am I going to find it? Hmm? I go walking around the room and then when I don't find it here, I'm going to look, check in the next room. And when I don't find it there, I'm going to check in the, ne the next room and then I'm going to go to the dumb hole and start looking for it. If I don't find it, I'm going to go looking the whole country, trying to find my glasses. When am I going to find it? Why not? Because it's with me. Why do people not find happiness? Hmm? Because it's with them. And they look out there for it. The day you stop looking for it out there, you are happy. Forever you keep looking out there, you're never happy. So when you get back home today, look around. Go into your living room, look around you. All the things that you bought for yourself, expecting them to make you happy. Look at your TV, look at your flower vase, look at your depot, look at your carpets, look at your curtains, look at your sofa, look at the pillows, look at the blankets, look at all the things you have at home, look at the fish tank, look at your children, for heaven's sake. Look at your wife, look at your husband. You can ask yourself, did I, why did I bring all these things with me? Why did I surround my life? Why did I build my, construct my whole life around me with those things? Because I thought they were going to make me happy. Are you happy today? Once you've taken a 360 degree turn, close your eyes and ask yourself this question, am I happy? Oh. You will realize you're not. Because happiness doesn't come from the outside world. Stop looking for it out there. But to stop looking for it, you need to understand the Dhamma. You can't just stop looking for it. It's not like, stop. Okay, stop. No. You need to understand the Dhamma. The Dhamma helps you realize happiness is within. It's not out there. That is why we need the Dhamma. Today I have proven to you that color is not out there. If color is not out there, then anything you're, you know, when you get back home, do this as an example. When you get back home, look at all the things you have and you bought it because of the color. Walk outside, look at your garden. Maybe you have red roses, you like roses, you like violets, you like daffodils, whatever. You like anthuriums, right? Because you like the color. Now ask yourself, where's the color? Then ask yourself, is it, is it worth me putting so many hours every day to, 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 you know, to look after this and to fertilize this and to tend to it? Ask yourself the question. If I do it because of the color. If you do it because of relaxation, you know, because you want to be with nature, so be it. But relaxation doesn't come from the name from nature anyhow. We'll address that on another day. But if you're doing it for color, then at least come to teach yourself this lesson before you continue doing it. Color is not out there. It's in the mind. So why am I doing this? I don't mind you drinking poison, provided you know that it's poison. That's okay. Because then you expect to die. The problem is when you drink poison thinking that it's not. Because you don't expect to die and then you're disappointed. Right, time's up for today. Let's do a merit transfer and bring the sermon to a close. Let us all take a moment then to transfer the mates that we have all acquired by making offerings to the infinite virtues of the noble triple gem, chanting period, listening to the Dhamma, inviting the Swami Nuhansi to deliver the sermon as well as creating a conducive environment for all to practice the path 
and engaging in various meritorious deeds. First and foremost, let us remind ourselves how incredibly fortunate we are to be in the presence of the Lord Buddha's teaching and with immense gratitude towards the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis who have since time immemorial protected and preserved the sublime teachings of the Buddha and passed it down through the generations of the noble lineage in the form of the Sripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us transfer these merits to them. Let us also transfer the merits we have acquired to all members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all the chapters who have dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us also transfer these merits to all monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries, as well as Guru Swami Mahanse and all the monks resident at the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to the Anagarikas and Anagarika communities attached to the monastery, as well as all the noble associates that you have the honor and privilege of associating at the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to a and express our gratitude to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transliterating these talks, sharing them out with others, or inviting others to join them. May they all rejoice in these merits. May the power of these, may by the power of these merits, they, abs- they be freed from any mental and physical ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibban. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these mates to our devotees and friends of the monastery who for the sake of merits continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone from those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes and medicines as well as those who provide the Mahasangha, those who provide the sasana with their know-how and continue to extend their well wishes. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer these merits to our mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our friends, our acquaintances, our employers and our employees, our teachers, as well as anyone and everyone who have helped us, supported us and assisted us in any way, shape or form by the power of these merits. May they all be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer this message to the devas and brahmas, spirits and demons, primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the Nimas, gods and deities who have committed themselves towards the betterment, towards preserving and fulfilling the Sambhudasasana. Let us also transfer these merits to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. May they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to our loved ones who have passed away in our name, our forefathers and our ancestors, reminding ourselves that it is in their blood, sweat and tears today we are able to enjoy the comforts of life and practice the path in peace and harmony. Let us also transfer these merits to members of the armed forces as well as the police force who sacrifice their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nation as well as those who lost their lives in the wars, be their friend or foe. Let us also transfer these merits to those who lost their lives in natural disasters, such as the tsunamis and earthquakes, landslides, fires, floods, pandemics, and so on, reminding ourselves that in this infinite long journey of sansara, they will all have been mothers and fathers to us, brothers and sisters to us, friends and acquaintances to us. They'll have gone the extra mile on our behalf, helped us, supported us, and assisted us in any way, shape, or form possible and available to them. Out of gratitude and gratefulness, let us take a moment to transfer all the merits we have acquired to all of them. May they all rejoice in these merits. If any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May by the power of these merits they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may by the power of and blessings of all the merits we have acquired throughout the day, we be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of arahants on this blessed land. And may you and I, and everyone who's helped make this program a success, become a Rahatan Nuhanse or an Arahat Terani Nuhanse in this very life itself and in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. And the members of the Mahasangha will transfer their blessings to you now. <coughs> <coughs> Raga Ginnamidatnva Dvesha Ginnamidatnva Moha Ginnamidatnva Nibbana Paramas 
सुखयन सुखित तार निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार ममद सियलु लोक सियलु सत्वयो निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार निबान परम सुखयन सुखित तार